Good morning, everybody. We are about to get started with our first panel of the day, um, which I have to say has got to be one of the favorite panels I've had the pleasure of moderating, uh, not least because I don't even need sort of uh, notes for introducing uh, all of my really good friends that are on the stage with me. These sort of represent some of the most fantastic uh, people from our OpenCon network. And for those of you that aren't familiar with OpenCon, uh, OpenCon is a relatively new conference uh, that Spark and the Right to Research Coalition started in 2014. And the idea of OpenCon is to really bring together the most uh, passionate, the most effective, the most engaged students, early career librarians, early career researchers, really sort of the best folks representing the next generation. Um, and sort of as part of that, you know, people that are starting off in their career generally don't have terribly good access to travel funding. And so, um, you know, as a commitment to, uh, you know, these early career individuals, we try to cover the cost of travel um, for everybody. And because of that, um, we actually have an application process, somewhat ironically, um, to really, you know, uncover the sort of most deserving, uh, most effective folks. Um, and so, uh, I'm sort of pleased to share that over the last two years since we started OpenCon, we've brought together about um, 300 participants from uh, well over 40 countries around the world. Uh, and those 300 participants uh, were chosen um, from more than 5,000 applicants from over 156 countries uh, around the world. So this map uh, behind me uh, shows you all the, the countries highlighted in orange are uh, countries that we received OpenCon applications from. Um, in, in 2015, or in 2015 um, which I think uh, is a fairly complete map. We're not all the way there. We have uh, certainly some room <coughs> to grow, but I think it gives you an idea of sort of how international um, the meeting is. Um, and so I think, you know, Karen, Brady, uh, April, and Rashawn uh, are fantastic examples uh, of what this community um, is capable of. But I would also like to invite the other OpenCon alumni uh, to stand briefly. So if you like OpenCon and want to talk to, uh, to people about sort of that experience, um, you can identify these lovely folks in your chat with them. And two panels later today will also feature OpenCon alumni uh, and Meredith Niles and Aaron uh, McKiernan. Uh, so after sort of listening to uh, these four fantastic individuals, you want to sort of clone them and bring them back to your campus. Mm -hmm. uh, we've set up a form at opencon2016.org forward slash more um, where you can sort of sign up. It's an interest form if you want to sponsor somebody from your campus uh, to attend and sort of get somebody really riled up and ready to sort of push open forward on your campus. If you go to uh, this address and fill in the form, uh, we will, you'll be the first to know uh, once OpenCon 2016 dates are announced, which will be shortly. And also, um, as a benefit of membership for Spark, uh, Spark members have sort of the first crack at the limited number of scholarships um, that we have. So if you fill in the form, uh, we will follow up with you so you have the chance to sponsor somebody from your campus to attend. And just finally, uh, I want to thank you all, uh, the membership of Spark, for supporting us um, and our vision to bring this to life, not only um, you know, through Spark membership, but also in sponsoring people from your institutions, which really made um, OpenCon possible. And so you know, I hope you feel real investment um, in sort of these stories and the stories that you might hear um, when talking to people um, you know, like Meredith uh, or Aaron or uh, you know, many of the other OpenCon alums. So, uh, with that, I will stop talking and let our fantastic OpenCon alumni start. So I'd like to invite Karen up, who's uh, a junior doctor uh, in Oxford. Um, one of the best things about Karen is once she gets an idea, she just runs with it um, immediately. I met her, started talking to her about open access, like within, I don't know, a few months, she got the British Medical Association uh, to endorse open access uh, you know, as sort of a priority, and then has gone on to do that with uh, the Fulbright uh, program, which is fantastic. So. Karen, please. <coughs> um, hi there. Um, so yeah, my name is Karen. Um, I'm a junior doctor and early career researcher in Oxford in the UK. So um, thank you so much for having us all here. I think I completely would agree with Nick's sentiments that I feel like I'm standing amongst friends, which is a, a real privilege. Um, and um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the open access policy I've been helping Fulbright to develop. I'm just going to change the slides because it's different to the ones that are here. So. Um, uh, I was very lucky to be funded by a uh, Fulbright Scholarship last year when I took a year out of my clinical practice to do um, a year of research. Um, and I think this slide probably emphasises everything I'm about to say, um, uh, which is that uh, 
approaching open access for me as a clinician, as a scientist, uh, avoid, avoiding the fear of the task ahead has been a, a key goal, <laughs> and in which the OpenCon community has been completely instrumental. So um, as, I, um, as I mentioned, I was lucky last year, I was funded for a year by the Fulbright um, Commission uh, to do research at Yale University into brain cancers. Um, so although the Fulbright Network is probably very familiar to many of you, I'll, I'll just explain a little more about it. So it's funded over the years um, over 300,000 scholarships between the USA and the rest of the world, and funds about 8,000 grants per year for students and early career researchers to, to do research in the USA or anywhere else in the world if, if you're from the USA. Um, it's funded something like 43 Nobel Prize winners and 78 Pulitzer Prize winners and lots of other scary statistics that I'm intimidated to live up to. But um, <laughs> for me, it was an amazing opportunity to go and, and uh, pursue research uh, in the USA, and I was funded by the US-UK Fulbright Program. But it obviously became apparent to me, having had an interest already in open access, that it didn't actually have an open access policy. And this is despite the fact that many funding organisations, such as those I've listed here, did. And obviously, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, but it seemed to me also that this was very in keeping with the um, mission of the Fulbright Network to have an open access policy. So the Fulbright uh, Network uh, was derived from an idea from Senator Fulbright after the Second World War in 1946 uh, when he wanted to set up a scholarship network that would foster cultural exchange and international understanding between the USA and the rest of the world. And this seems very in keeping right, with what open access is about. You know, we want to do our research and we feel very passionately about it and we want as many people to find out about it as possible. So this seemed like a, an easy fit. So um, I was asked um, when, we talk, when we did sort of a similar presentation at OpenCon 2015 this year, how, how to get started. And I think it was some of the questions that were also raised yesterday, like how do you even get started on this process? And for me, it was as simple as writing a letter. Um, and um, I kept, it, I kept it brief and I kept it personal because I think it's important when you're approaching someone who doesn't really have any knowledge of it that it's not intimidating from the go. So, um, so I, I also decided to be bold and just go straight for the top. So I wrote to the CEO of US UK Fulbright, having met her never before. <laughs> um, and, uh, and thinking, well, she seems, she's, I, I feel like I might as well because what have I kind of got to lose? Um, so I, I know my letter, I, I sort of outlined a bit about what open access was, was about and why it mattered to me as a, as a clinician and um, as, a, as a junior scientist. Um, and I think that's interesting because I think as a clinician, a junior clinician, um, we're often cited as being kind of the, one of the cases for open access, right? Because um, for my clinical practice, I need to stay up to date with what's, what's most evidence-based medicine um, to give the highest quality care. Um, and yet I think actually we're quite a silent voice often. Um, and I think actually we need to be more vocal. So I, I, I feel quite passionate that uh, you know, I'm happy to be a, a sort of spokesperson for the clinical community <laughs> in this. Um, and ultimately I offered to help, despite the fact that I now and always feel like a complete open access novice. But ultimately, again, I think you have to be willing to kind of offer some help to people who know perhaps a bit less than you do. So um, I um, then was very lucky that I, I, was I, I met Welcome Ears and the CEO of uh, US UK Fulbright thought this was a great idea um, and was very receptive and we arranged a, a very productive meeting. Um, and sorry, as I say, my slides were a little different before, but basically I, I think they have been amazingly supportive, which I, th I know I've been very lucky in. But I ultimately had to go to this meeting um, assuming, as I say, I feel like I'm a complete open access novice, but I'm probably a bit less of a novice than they are. Um, and that's the spirit I think I had to go into that meeting with. Um, and I was very happy to admit the things that I did not know. And because I knew that I had this incredible resource, this incredible community that I had been part of after OpenCon 2014, um, upon whom I could draw for information. Um, and that was really the key, really, was using the OpenCon community. Um, after the OpenCon 2014 conference in DC, we set up the monthly OpenCon community call, which has been completely key for me to kind of access many of you who are actually sitting in front of me now, um, to whom I'm very grateful for the advice that you've given me about how on earth you do all of this. Um, so, um, and that came, led us on to the next bit, which was developing a policy. Now, I, I've, as Nick has outlined, I've kind of done a bit of policy work, but it's quite a different, you know, making a statement on open access and writing an entire policy, clearly. Um, so um, this was all a little bit scary, but um, I basically tried to write a paper which was digestible for the Fulbright board, which was about kind of what open access is, kind of what the options were. And I think even from this point, I was very conscious that there's obviously there's the big dream, there's the, 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 the golden vision. But, but that's not always possible, and um, 
I was keen to give them options because I knew that we were maybe going to have to meet somewhere in the middle to try and, just in terms of moving things forward faster, rather than waiting longer to achieve the, big, the bigger goal. And then obviously this happens, because that's uh, how big organisations work, and they have to go and discuss it amongst themselves, um, <laughs> because ultimately it comes down to this. And I don't mean that um, in any unkind way at all, but as we all know, and as I'm very acutely aware as a researcher myself, money is tight and these things have to be paid for and no matter how open source everything is, repositories, etc., um, they still have to be set up. So, and the, and the US, UK Fulbright Commission and as is the Commission worldwide is, is largely government funded, which is obviously a case for open access in itself, but is ultimately a challenge because they haven't you know, got lots of money to spend like the rest of us. So this brings us to phase two, which is actually writing the policy. Um, so by this point, um, we had the great news that the Fulbright Board had completely supported the idea of open access and the fact that we should have an open access policy, which is obviously in itself hugely exciting. Um, and I think in keeping with what I was saying about pragmatism, we, we decided that the path of green was the way forward. So the plan was that we were going to write our Fulbright policy endorsing open access, um, that we would pilot um, a, this sort of policy for the, for the cohort starting this year, um, and that we were going to start Fulbright's repository. Um, you know, small goals <laughs> um, for an absolutely enormous uh, network. So that's why we thought we would do a pilot for the US-UK network and then um, the, the CEO that I've been in touch with has just been amazing in, in liaising with essentially the rest of the Fulbright network all over the world um, and hopefully over time we can, we can encourage them to participate as well. So then we come on to the making a repository concept, which I realise I'm standing in front of a group of librarians, but mm. I'm a clinician, I'm a scientist, I mean, give me an acutely unwell patient and I'll, you know, hopefully know what to do. Give me an experiment <laughs> plan, I'm all over it. But um, <laughs> making a repository is not in my armory of skills. So um, this is really where the OpenCon community came in. Um, we have this monthly open, open con community call, uh, which is um, populated by people, as I say, in this room, librarians, early career researchers, and um, I basically threw it out to them and said, please, can you help me? I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, how do I do this? Um, and ultimately, we had, we, I was really grateful for their thoughts as to how I could, you know, simple things like even where do I find a repository server? Um, and it, ultimately, all these things do come down to funding and time. But it meant that I was able to go to Fulbright and give them the information they needed um, to kind of keep moving forward. Um, and eventually, we've had to kind of come to a compromise for a long-winded number of reasons, which I won't go into. But essentially, we're working with the Open University, um, who are developing new software called Core, which is it feels to me a bit like a repository within a repository. And we're still kind of fine-tuning the details of that. But um, but that's because those are resources that were available to us. And I guess when we're starting a new um, policy, one has to, you, you, there are local factors and external factors that you have to kind of meet somewhere in the middle, and this seems like a good fit for what we're trying to do for the time being. But obviously that's not the only challenge, and I've just outlined some of them here. Um, we're very, we were very lucky to have some um, input from JISC, um, who kind of gave, a, gave us just a bunch of questions that we had to answer, and I mean, these are all probably quite familiar to you, but again, as, a, as an open access relative novice, um, these are difficult questions to answer, as being as I spend my days doing this, rather than this. So um, what would you put in a repository? What counts as scholarly output? Do we say this is mandatory or do we make it as a strong recommendation while we're kind of fine-tuning the details? What are the, you know, how do we police this, basically? Um, what are preprints and postprints? And I'm talking to an audience who knows what those words mean, but, but not, not everybody does. Um, similarly, what kind of, um, what, what about um, sort of embargo periods, which I know are kind of, we don't, we're not obviously fans of them, but you know, some funders do still have to have them in place. So there are lots of big questions that need specifying, outlining, and clarifying. Um, so how do we address these? Again, again, I can't emphasize enough how much the OpenCon community has been a key part of this um, and allow, has allowed us to have a very open di dialogue with Fulbright because it's all a learning curve for all of us. And I think to an extent accepting evolution as part of the revolution. Um, and hopefully over time we can obviously go towards a green model, but I think it's really exciting what we've managed to achieve so far. So where we are now is that we've got board approval for a Fulbright policy on open access, which is great. Um, and hopefully this year we'll be setting up the, the pilot uh, within the US-UK network for um, the Fulbright policy and the repository. Um, and we would obviously in the longer term hope to roll that out uh, to the broader, broader Fulbright network. Um, and it's already been really exciting to meet some key people here, who can sit in front of me, with whom we've got kind of big visions for a, a kind of a bigger vision for the Fulbright repository network, which I'm really excited to, uh, to move forward with you on. So I guess my feeling has been that the key is just to start the conversation. Um, and that has been kind of the case 
for all the things that have happened in the past generally. Um, I guess the degree of realism has been important to get this moving forward. Um, and for me, the getting um, advice from the Open Con community has been absolutely key. Um, but I think from that, you know more than... I've definitely realised that one knows more than one thinks, but for me, it's not necessarily the things that I know. It's more like what my network knows, and that is very powerful. Um, and the evolution versus revolution debate, I'm personally very excited about what the future holds for um, just this network, but also how that can be a kind of hopefully a platform for other sort of scholarship funds. And just generally, I, I, even just being here for the last couple of days, had so many exciting ideas from having discussions with you all here. So very exciting. And um, this is our very, the very first OpenCon conference in 2014. Um, and I think I would speak for all of us when I say thank you so much for supporting it, um, because it's been an amazing thing to be part of, life-changing, a game-changer for all of us that have been part of it. Um, and I've just put a little link for the community call if you're interested in, in seeing what that's all about as well. <laughs> thank you so much, though. Um, we are very, very grateful and um, excited to keep moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Brady uh, Yano from Simon Fraser uh, University uh, up in Vancouver. And just one thing I recently learned about Simon Fraser University, the student leaders there apparently have a habit of going on to being uh, fairly high profile politicians from time to time in Canada, um, which is exciting. So <laughs> with that, Brady. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Nick. There's definitely no pressure. Uh, thank you. Uh, and just before I begin today, I just wanted to mention uh, that today is International Women's Day. Uh, Karen did have that in her revised presentation, uh, but unfortunately it did not make it to the slide. So thank you to all the women here and thank you to all the women in our lives who inspire us every day. Um, so I'm here today to present on SFSS OER advocacy. So a bunch of you guys are probably thinking, what is the Simon Fraser Student Society? Uh, so the Simon Fraser Student Society represents the undergraduate students at Simon Fraser University. Uh, that totals 29,000 students and we're made up of a board of directors of 16 students, uh, myself being one of them. Uh, today's presentation is going to give an overview of the past uh, two years that I've been involved with the Student Society and the open textbook advocacy that I have done. Um, so how did it all begin? Uh, I would love to take credit uh, for bringing the open movement to campus, uh, but unfortunately I cannot. Uh, it was my colleague, Sharday Buchert, uh, who actually addressed this issue, um, being a prominent one for undergraduate students. Um, looking at the amount of money students pay on textbooks, as we heard yesterday from the presentation from the colleague from Texas A&M, uh, cost is a big factor. And for a student politician, the ability to save students money, uh, tangibly, uh, is huge. Um, so Chardé saw this as a huge win and she recognized that the BC contribution from the provincial government to allocate $2 million to the creation of uh, open textbooks which would cover the 40 most popular first and second year courses uh, taken within the province uh, was a huge deal and it was time for students to act on this and start being proactive about it. Uh, so the costs, I can largely gloss over this side. I think we're all largely familiar with the current cost breakdown. Uh, I just wanted to uh, note the graph on the screen. So this is actually taken from SFU's uh, recruitment uh, campaign material for this uh, year. Uh, so they are already telling students uh, that have no idea of the university structure uh, that they should be expected to pay $1,000 a semester. And again, this is assuming that uh, all students are taking 10 credits per year in order to graduate in four years, uh, which unfortunately is often not the case. Um, but still, they are already educating students that they should be uh, getting ready to pay $1,000 a semester. So students are coming to university um, not questioning this and expecting that this is the norm. Ah, perfect. Uh, so just in the Canadian context, uh, I just wanted to give you guys a couple of numbers of how many students are actually enrolled. Uh, so we currently have, uh, based on the 2013-2014 Academic uh, Year Statistics Canada uh, numbers, uh, there was over 2 million students enrolled in post-secondary institutions across the province. Of those, we had roughly 1.5 million who were enrolled full-time. Uh, so assuming, conservatively here, that students are only paying $600 per year on textbooks, uh, we can see how significant that number is. It's $919 million. And you can just imagine what it is in the American context. 
Uh, so to get a better sense of how much or how much of a burden uh, the price of textbooks were for students, uh, we decided to ask students in very generic, easy Facebook posts uh, some of the most drastic things that they had done to avoid paying for textbooks. Um, and some of the more interesting examples I'm going to read for you guys. Um, so one student said, I'd walk around the bookstore and pick classes based on which ones had the least expensive slash number of books. Another student said, I tended to just not use the textbook or borrow from classmates for a day or two and just stay up all night and take all the notes on essential chapters. And the third, which I think is very interesting, is I've used pretty much every trick there is to avoid paying exorbitant textbook costs. One time, I was only able to find a certain textbook in a different language. So I illegally downloaded the PDF, copied the text, put it through Google Translate, and went through the rest of my semester with that. <coughs> my translation was pretty subpar. It is Google Translate after all. And all in all, it took the better part of a day to end up with a poorly translated version of a textbook I needed. So some of our initial attempts. Uh, we thought this was a great idea. The government had allocated these funds. Faculty would pick these books up, and it would be that easy. Uh, so we thought it would be as simple as doing generic tabling, educating students on the availability of these resources, and encouraging students to email their professors uh, to adopt these materials. However, uh, that was not the best approach uh, and did not uh, get us the results that we were hoping for. Oops. And so this is where I do a special plug for OpenCon. So both Charday and I had the opportunity to attend the first OpenCon in Washington, DC. And going into that, I think neither of us really understood how big the open umbrella was. Uh, we observed uh, open textbooks as being a key issue for students for cost reasons. And so we thought if we could alleviate this cost burden to students, that would make us very favorable student politicians, which would help in our reelection. Um, <laughs> And I mean, going into this, again, we had no idea that there was a big open education movement. We had no idea of the scope of open access, and we surely had no idea that open data was a thing. Um, and so OpenCon really opened our eyes to the world of open. Uh, not only did it connect us with these amazing colleagues I have on the stage right now, and many of you guys in the audience, uh, it just gave us the inspiration and also a key set of ideas for how to actually move forward with open uh, on campus and make a big difference. So what did we do following OpenCon? Um, I have quite an exhaustive list here, so I'm gonna to try to summarize it uh, quite briefly. Uh, the first thing that we did not realize prior to going to OpenCon was that the library was a huge resource for us. Uh, so we thought, contact faculty, contact senior administration, that was kind of the end. Um, so after OpenCon, we immediately set up a meeting with our Dean of Libraries, who is extremely supportive of our movement, and actually started to get the ball rolling on their end to support Open. Uh, beyond that, we did set up meetings with the Graduate Student Society on campus. We wanted to really get the buzz coming from both undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, we met with the SFU Faculty Association President. Uh, we asked a question at the SFU Senate, which is the academic governing body of the institution, uh, basically asking them how supportive they were of the BC Open Textbook uh, Project. Uh, we also met with the VP Academic, the VP Research, etc. So uh, we really tried to get the buzz going on campus. Um, so some of the challenges we faced at SFU uh, primarily was the lack of uptake of these materials. Uh, to date, SFU still has not adopted a single uh, OER, which is quite uh, disappointing. Um, and there was really, we just recognized that there was this lack of awareness across the entire university community for what OERs were and what the benefits were. Um, we also came across some issues such as publisher pressure to certain faculty members to use certain materials. Uh, and we also got responses uh, from the university community that there is issues with academic freedom um, for the university to take a strong stance in actually advocating for these materials. Um, so coming into this next um, board year, um, so Chardet had left me at this point, so I had to come up with some new ideas for how to A, get a new can or a similar campaign going, uh, and B, really engaging students who had already heard about our open textbook buzz but had not yet seen any action come from what we were advocating for the previous year. Uh, so the, this campaign, hashtag textbook broke BC, uh, was actually an idea that I learned about at OpenCon 2014. And so it was a campaign that was led by US Perg uh, and Ethan Senek, who we had the privilege of hearing from uh, at OpenCon. Uh, and essentially this campaign uh, moved across the United States to different campuses, and again, focused particularly on the high cost of textbooks. 
Um, so we decided to adopt this catchy uh, campaign name on our campus, and we also decided that we had to expand beyond the walls of SFU in order to make this uh, tangible and real campaign. Uh, so we contacted our friends over at the UBC, which is the University of British Columbia, and together we were the two. We are the two largest post-secondary institutions in the province. Uh, so we represent over 80,000 undergraduate students, and when you have that amount of pull. Uh, we were hoping that the provincial government, again, would recognize that this contribution was huge, they should continue supporting it, and faculty at every institution, as well as senior administration, should also be supportive of the movement. Um, so our campaign started uh, very simply back in September 20, I guess it'd be 2015, um, and we developed these neat little bookmarks in which we gave students outside of the book, uh, bookstore. Um, so our call to action for students was to take a picture of their receipt from their bookstore purchase and tweet it using the hashtag textbookbrokebc. Um, so if you guys open up Twitter, you can definitely track our progress uh, for how the campaign went. Um, but unfortunately, we realized that a lot of undergraduate students don't use Twitter. Um, so we had a lot of good buzz on Facebook. However, the majority of undergraduate students at both SFU and UBC did not seem to be active Twitter users. Um, so come January, we decided we had to fix up our campaign and decided to focus primarily on Facebook. Um, so we ran a contest and again, we did tabling outside of the bookstore during the first week of classes when students are buying all of their textbooks. And this was again run both at SFU and UBC. Um, so we got students uh, to volunteer to take a photo with us and display the amount of money that they spent on textbooks. Uh, we then took these 69 images, uh, put them on Facebook, and had a voting period for one week in which we asked uh, the participants to really generate a buzz on social media and get as many likes and shares on their photo as possible. Uh, so my friend Isabella up here ended up receiving uh, over, she received 521 likes and 15 shares on Facebook. Um, so we, after that uh, amount of attention and media buzz, we were very happy to cut her a check for $410 and pay for her textbooks for this semester. And so we also wanted to develop some sort of visual display uh, and also get a sense of what students would prefer to buy instead of textbooks. Uh, so just a little zoomed up image there. So we asked students instead of textbooks, I could have bought. Um, and the amount of response, our top two responses, I mean, I don't think any of us would have really expected it, but we had 37 students express that food was the number one thing that they would have bought instead of textbooks. The second was paying for rent. I mean, these are real things that students need to pay for. We, yes, we did get the occasional student mentioning alcohol or uh, tickets uh, to a concert or a Canucks game, but primarily the top two were food and rent. It was amazing. So just some of the opportunities uh, moving forward. Student union collaboration has been huge. Um, in the previous year when Chardet and I were advocating, it was really just an SFU effort. Uh, having the University of British Columbia on board as well was amazing. And I know there's a colleague out in the audience today who's from UBC. <laughs> Uh, and beyond that, we also contacted uh, friends over at the University of Alberta, uh, again, which is the largest uh, research intensive university in Alberta, and they also ran a textbook campaign. So we're hoping that this campaign, uh, again, is going to grow and is going to be adopted on more campuses uh, across Canada. Um, this is also a huge opportunity uh, for the, all of you guys in the room to really collaborate with students. Um, again, I think. For us moving into this campaign, we just were not aware of the scope and amount of the re aware of the resources and the allies that exist on campus. Um, so I encourage all of you today to go back to your various institutions and reach out to students because they definitely feel the pinch uh, on their wallets for paying for textbooks, and they will definitely be vocal advocates for this change. Um, and beyond that, um, one opportunity that's very exciting up at Simon Fraser. Um, has been spearheaded by both the Dean of Libraries as well as the Teaching and Learning Center. So they submitted a proposal to the VP Academic uh, to develop three grants uh, which should be offered per semester for the next three semesters for any faculty members interested in taking an existing open textbook from the BC Campus Library uh, and adapting and modifying it to fit their course. Um, so each grant is valued at $5,000. Um, and the first call out for applications was back in February. So come fall, and by the way, they did receive an overwhelming amount of responses, uh, which is amazing. And so come fall, SFU will have its three first open textbook adoptions. 
Um, the subsequent semester, we will have another three. And the subsequent semester, we will have another three. So that's going to be nine open textbook adoptions, which are going to save students a ton of money, which is incredibly exciting. Um, so again, the lessons learned, there's allies everywhere. It's not just you advocating for this on campus. People are there. The OpenCon community is here. Uh, we would love to make ourselves as widely available as possible to help you guys in your efforts in engaging with OERs on campus. Um, beyond that, I mean, I think a lot of you guys are already aware of um, the movement that's taking place and basically how much of a buzz it's receiving. Um, open is the future. It's time for everyone to embrace it. And if you don't, you're really going to be behind in the game. And so I just wanted to end on this note. Uh, so this was an adoption that did not take place at SFU, but did take place at the University of British Columbia. Um, so from the adoption of one physics textbook, and this is a physics 100 course, which is one of the um, most enrolled courses at SFU, or sorry, at UBC. Um, so for the, this one adoption, for the two semesters alone, they were able to save students $90,000. That's huge. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this conference, and I look forward uh, to answering any questions that you guys have. Thank you so much, and apologies for going over time. <laughs> Thanks so much, Brittany. That was quite two minutes. Yeah, I think the, the point that Brady made about working with student governments is a really um, important one um, that I think he did a great job uh, articulating. But the other thing I want to point out is that we sort of are bookended in the middle uh, of folks from Spark member libraries. You know, you have uh, student government representative Simon Fraser, a Spark member, and then April, who is at the University of Guelph, which is also uh, a Spark member. So these are people that are sort of um, you know on campuses like yours, which I think is is really exciting. So. April, if you'll come up and tell us about an organization that I think might have the best name uh, ever. Oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had some debate about the best name, but this is a conversation starter, and it also inspired a theme song written by Mike Eisen, so I think we made the right choice in the end. Um, so my name is April Clyburn Sharon, as Nick mentioned. Um, I'm here to represent my colleagues as part of the O Canada Research Network. Uh, we're working to promote open access, open data, and open education at Canadian institutions. And our mission is to help Canadians become leaders in open research. We respond at OpenCon 2014, and to echo every, everything that these uh, lovely colleagues of mine have said already, um, we wouldn't exist if it weren't for OpenCon. So how do we advance our mission? We are, we've been working towards helping uh, leadership opportunities for open researchers in Canada in three ways. Uh, one, we're a network. So we connect like-minded people together and it helps to improve the impact and the scope of the things that they're working on. Secondly, we provide support and help to help people get things started that haven't tried anything like this before at their institution. And finally, we work to add, val <clears throat> Excuse me. To add value to um, existing open initiatives across Canadian institutions. And we do this by pooling our resources, by sharing our best practices. What's worked at one institution can work at another one. And finally, by helping to coordinate a wider effort um, to work together and reach more people. So as many of you know, um, open is a mixed bag in Canada right now, and we have some great things going on, so I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but open access, we have a policy with the three main government funders to publish uh, those uh, research that's published by those funders, or funded by those funders, has to be published open access. We don't have that kind of coordinated policy with open data. There's some scattered, limited policies, so there's still a lot of work to be done with open data in Canada. And as Brady mentioned, open education, we have some great leadership going on in open education in Canada, and Brady can talk to, to that <laughs> more specifically if you have questions of specifics. And so what do we do at the O Canada Research Network? Uh, primarily, we support each other. So we meet on a regular basis, we provide each other with resources, we help each other out with their own experiences, and we put each other in contact with people that we think can help, help each other out. We're working towards creating leadership opportunities. 
So we're hoping to become a place that students and other researchers can come to to get started if they have an idea. We can pull together as a community and help make it happen. We're also working to keep the discussion going on open research in the Canadian context. So we do this in, a multiple, in multiple ways. We have a website, which is a great first point of contact for someone that's just learning about open research and want to know what it means for their institution in Canada. We also work on social media and we have a blog where we can voice opinions about things that are happening in the world and also in Canada um, related to open research and anything that is of interest to researchers in Canada. But we want to take this discussion further. We want to turn it into action and we want to turn it into the building of a community. So we've been doing this through uh, events. We've had a few successful events so far and I think it's been the most valuable thing that we've done. Every time that we hold an event, we build our community and we, we reach more people and we get more ideas and we get more resources. So we've had a few successful um, few successful, successful <laughs> events, sorry, um, including our OpenCon satellite event, which had 50 students and we were able to raise money to bring in people that wouldn't have been able to afford to attend our event um, as well. So that was very important to us, to not be just centered in the big cities, but to bring in people from other institutions. So with every event that we hold, we've been able to grow our community and we've been able to build what we're capable of doing. So as I mentioned, and as um, my colleagues mentioned earlier, uh, we started at OpenCon 2014. And uh, when, we, when we were first coming to OpenCon, we knew a little bit about open research, we knew a little bit about open access, but we were disconnected. So I don't mean just that we were disconnected from one another, though that was also important. Um, meeting like-minded people was really um, invaluable to, to learning more and to getting more done. But we were also disconnected with the idea that we could start something. So coming to OpenCon was a place where we were meeting people who were li like just like us. You know, we, didn't, we weren't experts on open access. We were not advocates. We didn't have experience. We didn't have money and we didn't have resources. And we assumed that this was going to limit our ability to do things. But we met people at OpenCon who were just like us that didn't have access to the same things that we didn't have access to, but they were doing amazing things. Specifically, we saw a talk by the founder of Open Access Nigeria. And he talked about all these great initiatives that he had going on in Nigeria. And we were thinking, so we're Canada, why can't we do this? So we started meeting at OpenCon 2014 and we haven't stopped. And with every meeting we're growing and we're learning more and we're coming up with new ideas and it was all because of OpenCon 2014. <clears throat> so what have we learned? I mean, the main thing that we've learned is that it's a lot of fun to work with like-minded, enthusiastic people, and that will keep you going. Um, when things are difficult, see, there's always challenges, especially in Canada. We're a huge country. We have time zones to deal with. We've got multiple languages to deal with. But together with enthusiastic volunteers, you can get through those things. So we decided early on we wanted to be an inclusive group. So we wanted everything to be done in both French and in English. And um, we made that a priority. And so a lot of the work we've been doing is making sure that all the resources that we have available in English right now and all the resources we're producing for people are also available in French. Um, we also learned about, about how to get things done when people don't have time. Because we're all volunteers and we all have other roles so um, we learned a lot about breaking down big ideas into small pieces and each taking a part and getting things done that way. And uh, most relevant to you all, we learned that librarians are our allies. At every institution we approached, coming to the librarians was the best way for us to learn not only what was going on at that institution, but who we should get in touch with, who might be interested in hearing more about us and in joining us. And, and again, um, we learned to take advantage of the OpenCon community 
to learn from them and learn from their experiences. And together, we were able to do a lot more. So the OpenCon community, we can get in touch with them many, many different ways. And it's filled with people that are really interested in what we're working towards and have had experiences that are beneficial to us and can help us to not make the same mistakes that they made or to use best practices. Whatever they've w done at their institution, we can help um, model the things that worked and avoid doing the things that didn't. <clears throat> so finally, I would like to invite you to join us. Um, we're a network, we're open to everybody who's interested in the same things that we're interested in. So you can do this in multiple ways. If you're a Canadian um, or are interested in Canada or in Canada, come to our events. Um, if you would like to join one of our meetings, that's great, the more the merrier. Um, also, if you are, uh, have an idea or an opinion that's related to open research that is relevant to Canadian researchers, even if